I'm not a religious fanatic by any stretch of the imagination. However, I do have an abiding faith in a power that is greater than me. I have been wise enough, even when I didn't recognize it, to accept the wisdom of others who were close to me who could see things that I could not see. Here's what I mean. I married a lady from Atlanta, Georgia. She's deceased now, about five years. But this lady probably had a greater influence on my life than anyone else. Her brother and Martin Luther King Jr. were classmates in high school in Atlanta. So when I married her and moved to Atlanta to stay with her mother, because we had no means of our own, I got to know Martin. He and I developed a friendship there that was enduring. We went separate ways. He went on into theology. He finished Morehouse College and Boston Theological Seminary. And I went on into medicine. But my wife urged me to go back to Georgia when I got my medical degree. I don't want to go back into that damnable society where I cannot use the, the talents and the knowledge and the skills that I've developed. I want to stay up north. And she says, no. You made a promise years ago that if you ever got your education, you're going back to the deep south where you're needed. I did not fully recognize the implications of her insisting on me going back. By this time, Martin Luther King Jr. had successfully led the people in Montgomery, Alabama to desegregation of the buses, which was the beginning of the end of segregation, if you would, in public transportation. But going back to Albany, I did not go there to start up another civil rights movement. I went there to practice medicine. Basic, fundamental health care was not available to all the people in Albany. However, the members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, called SNCC, came to Albany to start a voter registration project. They were harassed, they were intimidated, they were arrested, they were abused in every kind of way. I could not stay in the comfort of my office and watch them being treated in that manner only because they came there to get poor black people registered to vote. I joined them. I joined in the marches. I became a leader of the Albany movement by default, not because I went there to do that and ran for election, no, no, no. I was elected president, I say by default, because I had only been there a short period of time, number one. Number two, I was not dependent upon the white establishment for my income. I was depending upon these people who were trying to get to register and vote. At the height, of the activity in Albany, thousands of people had gone to jail. I remembered a friendship that I had developed with Martin Luther King Jr. and incidentally, Rep. David Abernathy, and that's another story, but also befriended when I was a student in Montgomery, Alabama. I called him to come help. He came to Albany with no intention of staying. People came for hundreds of miles around because they heard he'd be in town. And that night he made a commitment that he would stay with Albany until some change came. And the only change we asked for, incidentally, was let's have a meeting. Let's you, white establishment, meet with the leadership in the black community to see what we can do to resolve our differences. And of course, we were rebuffed. They said, we have no common grounds for agreement. And that's when the movement started. Norma. Dixon was her name, who elected to marry me. Now mind you, for those men who think that they choose a wife, forget it. She chose me, and she gave me the best advice that could possibly be given me that put me in position to become a leader in the civil rights movement.